So we've looked at a variety of, I guess, more niche far-right groups in countries maybe you don't always think of automatically when we talk about this stuff. But today I thought it'd be interesting, and I've been wanting to make this video for a while, if we spoke about Iran and Iranian Nazis and just sort of Iranian nationalism in general. So what this video is going to do is we're going to look at the history of the term Aryan, because when I say that word, you probably think of, you know, Nazi Germany, but we're going to get into the ancient history of this word. Then we're going to get into the history of Iran and its collaboration with Nazi Germany in World War II. Then we're going to get into, I guess, pre- and post-war Iranian nationalism. And then we're also going to talk about the Iranian National Socialist Party and talk about some sort of modern Nazi drama in Iran itself. If you want to support my work continuing for the future, regardless of what YouTube do, please consider becoming a patron. If you want to join our growing community, please check out the Discord and the subreddit in the description. And if you want to follow me personally, check out at the Cavernacle on Instagram and Twitter. And also you slash Tommy Cahill1995 for my personal Reddit. Well, thank you guys so much for getting me to 30k in April. We're chugging along to 35. For every 5k, we get a new chocolate orange to help me build this pyramid. I live stream about two times a week and I archive the streams on the Cavernacle Extra, my second channel. So go check that out if you ever miss the streams or you just want to catch up on all of them. But with all that stuff out the way, let's get into the video. So like I outlined, we're going to talk about Aryan history and where this term comes from. So we have to go back to ancient Persia. So from Darius the Great inscription on the Nakshi Rostam, it says, I am Darius, the great king, the king of kings, the king of many countries and many people, the king of this expansive land, Persian, the son of a Persian, Aryan from the Aryan race. So the article called Iran Chamber says, Darius I in the 5th century BCE declares himself a Persian from the Aryan race. Herodotus, you might know him from Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Where is your path taking you now? To Thuri. What's waiting for you there? That's the exciting part. I have no idea. Widely seen as the world's first modern historian, writes in his book, The History of Herodotus, at the same time, in ancient times, the Greeks called Iranians Kaf, Kafi, not sure how to pronounce that, but they were renowned as Aryans among themselves and their neighbors. In another part of his book, Herodotus writes that the Medeans were known as Aryans during a certain period. So in two of the oldest written human documents, the race of the Iranians has been mentioned as Aryan. So why is this? And it actually does have a link with India as well. So the area in Iran, this is from the Mumbai mirror. So ancient Hindus called themselves Arya and their homeland Aryavata, which according to Manu Smriti, stretched from the Himalayas in the north to the sea in the south. But it does not refer to another Aryan community that lived in the same time in Iran. Iran, in fact, is the Persian word for Aryan. Iranians see themselves as the Arya. Before Iran became Islamic, it was Zoroastrian. Zoroastrianism is the world's oldest monotheistic religion. Avesta is its holy book, where Azura is good and the Diva is bad. The oldest evidence for the word Arya comes from the 2500 YBP Behistuin inscription from East Iran, in which the Persian king Darius, who we talked about, the Great and Xerxes, are described as Aryans of Aryan stock. Azura Mazda is called the god of the area, and the old Persian language is also called Arya. This was written around the same time as the Buddha lived in India. Ancient Greeks referred to the land between Central Asia and the Indus as Ariana, the land of the Arya, or the Iranian people. As per Iranian mythology narrated in ancient Avesta, Azura Mazda, or God, created the land of the Aryans surrounded by concentric rings of land and sea. At the center of the Aryan homeland was a mountain from which flowed a great river to the sea, and the first human, Geomart, was created on the riverbank. So this Aryan term is an ancient term, and of course we know it from modern day fascism from the Nazis, but it's widely used to refer to the Iranians under Darius the Great and Xerxes. But I wanna get into how this word was used by the Iranians in the Second World War. So now we're gonna talk about 
the links between the Iranian monarchy in the 1930s and Nazi Germany. And this is a very interesting collaboration because when we think of Iran in World War II, we think of the Tehran conference between Stalin, FDR and Churchill. And maybe we think about the Russians and the British getting rid of Reza Shah and putting his son in power, the son who would of course be the infamous Shah who was ousted by the revolution, but we probably don't think about what Iran was doing before then. So Howard Blum wrote a book called The Night of the Assassins, the untold story of Hitler's plot to kill FDR, Churchill and Stalin. And on his website, he has a quote from the book and he just describes a bit of the context for us. And I think it's very, very interesting. So the book says, a bond between a predominantly Muslim nation and Hitler's Third Reich may seem surprising, but Reza Shah's determination made it possible. The book saying, Reza Shah proudly howled whenever he got the chance that his people were not lowly Semites like their Jewish or Arab neighbours, but pure-blooded Aryans, the same as the Germans. He made sure the world got this message too. In 1935, he issued a proclamation to the League of Nations that henceforth the country of Persia would be called Iran. The name reaching back in time to the ancient roots and the Sanskrit phrase Aryanum Veja or home of the Aryans. In quick response, Germany bestowed their seal of racial purity on the kingdom. The Nuremberg laws that made anti-Semitism the law of the land were amended. Iranians and Nazis, racial nitpickers, formally adjudicated in 1936, were to be considered as Aryan as any full-blooded German. The happy kinship received further cultural staying power from the fact that the swastika was emblazoned all over Germany from the flag to the uniforms. It was the iconic emblem of the Third Reich, yet millennia before the crisscross geometric design had been designated as the calling card of the Nazis, it had been commonplace good luck symbol in Eurasia the word swastika can be traced back to the sacred Sanskrit text. The swastika had decorated Persian arts of the times of Zoroaster, carved into ancient stone columns, etched into tribal pottery. Now, this historical accident was deliberately seen as something more. Further proof of the deep-seated Aryan ties between the people of Reza Shah and the German Chancellor, who was called with deference in Iran, Hitler Shah. So along with Italy and Japan, Iran fought for Germany during World War II and supplied Germany with oil. In December 1943, Reza Shah and Hitler, along with their top strategists, helped to plan the assassinations of FDR, Churchill and Stalin in Tehran. To go in a bit more into the history, SF Gates had a good article in 2012 talking about this history as well. So they say, So the idea for the name chains was suggested by Iranian ambassador to Germany who came under the influence of Hitler's trusted banker, Hialmar Shiats. From that point, all Iranians were constantly reminded that their country shared a common bond with the Nazi regime. Shortly after World War II broke out in 1939, the Mufti of Jerusalem crafted a strategic alliance with Hitler to exchange Iraqi oil for active Arab and Islamic participation in the murder of Jews in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. This was predicated on support for a pan-Arab state and Arab control over Palestine. During the war years, Iran became a haven for Gestapo. It was from Iran that the seeds of the abortive 1941 pro-Nazi coup in Baghdad was planted. After Churchill's forces booted the Nazis out of Iraq in June 1941, German air crews supporting Nazi bombers escaped across Iraq's northern border back into Iran. Likewise, the Mufti of Jerusalem was spirited across the border to Tehran, where he continued to call for the destruction of Jews and the defeat of the British. And his venomous rhetoric filled the newspapers and radio broadcasts in Iran itself. So in the summer of 1941, the Mufti, with the support of key Iranian military and government leaders, advocated implementing in Iran what had failed months earlier in Iraq. The plan, once again, was for a total diversion of oil from the Allies to the Nazis in exchange for the accelerated destruction of Jews in Eastern Europe and the Nazi support for an Arab state. Through the Anglo-Iranian oil company, Iran had already been supplying Hitler's forces in occupied Czechoslovakia and Austria. Once the Mufti relocated permanently to Berlin, where he established his own Reich-supported bureau, he was given airtime on Radio Berlin. From Berlin and other fascist capitals in Europe, the Mufti continued to agitate for international Jewish destruction as well as a pan-Islamic alliance with the Nazi regime. He called on Muslims to kill Jews wherever they found them, and in Tehran's marketplace, it was common to see placards that declared, in heaven, Allah is your master, on earth, it is Adolf Hitler. So the Mufti raised three divisions of Islamic SS to undertake cruel operations in Bosnia, 
Among the 30,000 killers was some volunteer contingents from Iran, and we'll get back to this later. Iranian Nazis, along with other Muslim SS, operated under the direct supervision of Heinrich Himmler and were responsible for barbaric actions against Jews in Bosnia, and recruitment for this SS group was done openly in Iran. Iran and its leaders were not only aware, they played both sides, and the country offered overland escape routes for refugee Jews fleeing the Nazis, and later fleeing post-war fascists in Iraq, but only in exchange for extortionate fees. So that is a very interesting situation you have there in that because of the Aryan connection, the Shah does want this alliance with Nazi Germany. And then of course, you have a lot of the historic views towards Palestine. Of course, after World War I, it became the British Mandate of Palestine. You had more agitation with Palestinian Jews trying to create the Israeli state. So the Arabs are getting more restless of this stuff. And even though these Palestinian Jews were actually fighting the British as well, they did think it was maybe likely under British control that this may transition to an Israeli state. So you have all that stuff with Muslims and Iranian Muslims and like the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. And then you have the Iranian nationalism. And we're going to get into this specific brand of Iranian nationalism because today, I guess, it seems by contemporary politics, we think Iranian nationalism sort of goes hand in hand with like the Ayatollah, with Shia Islam and stuff. And they've obviously, you know, replaced the old Persian calendar and the old Persian cultural ways with more Islamic ways. But I want to get into what the Shah was sort of cultivating in this period. So the Shah's regime's definition of Iranianness finds its roots in the construction of an exclusivist Iranian identity in the 20s and 30s. The increasingly centralised and authoritarian state of Reza Shah sought to eliminate linguistic and cultural diversity by crafting a narrative of Persian-Iranian history that went back nearly 2,500 years that was united by the determination of the Persian people. This was, of course, artificial history, just as nationalisms often are. Both the Qajar and the Safavid dynasties preceding the Shah were Azuri Turkish, for example, and historically it was not ethnicity but ethnically neutral imperialism and the use of the Persian language as a lingua franca that had brought together the incredibly diverse peoples populating the lands under the control of the Persian Empire. So Reza Shah took his cue from the nationalist ideology sweeping Europe and Turkey. And Aryanism was one of the most influential of these ideologies. And it identified the Indo-European language tree, which included Sanskrit, Persian, and most European languages, as proof of a migration of an imagined Aryan nation out of India, through Persia, and into Europe. Aryanism was highly convenient for Europeans because it made sense of the Indian and Persian civilizations they were encountering through their colonial enterprises. So Reza Shah banned the use of other languages that weren't Persian in schools. Now I find this ideology he was cultivating pretty interesting and it actually went on under his son as well. This, you know, Persianness, this Aryanness, and all this looking back to the past to construct a fictional narrative. Now, I find there to be many parallels with Greek nationalism and Greek fascism here in that they are looking back to the ancient times and creating this fake narrative, this, you know, fake ethnic history of the so-called Aryan Persian people and how it's been very steady throughout the last 2,500 years. But like it was saying in the article, Iran itself is very diverse. It's often been ruled by different ethnicities, not just Persians and everything. And there's been many different languages. But again, with fascist history, you need to be revisionist because you can't accept you know, the nuances when you're creating this type of nationalism. So obviously, like I said earlier, his father was booted out by the Allies. His son was installed. And you guys will probably have heard of his son because it is the Shah who was eventually toppled by the revolution, which eventually installed the Islamic theocracy that we have in Iran today. But now I want to get into an interesting wrinkle in that although the Shah had these like overtly fascist leanings and beliefs and liked Adolf Hitler, but Iran was obviously a monarchy. But after the war, you obviously had more flourishing of democracy. You guys would have heard about the coup in 1953 and Mohammed Mosaddegh, Bernie Sanders spoke about this a lot. 
during his presidential campaigns. So there was various different parties, including the Communist Party. There was also a National Socialist Party. And I want to just talk about the National Socialist Party in Iran. But after the history we've actually gone through, it's probably not surprising that there was a National Socialist Party because many Iranians had fought for the SS. But information on this is really sparse. Just like with the Iranian Communist Party, you probably need to read like books and literature that isn't online, because I know I read about this stuff during my degree, but the founder was a guy called Davud Monshizda, who was the founder of the SUMKA, or the S-U-M-K-A, the Iranian National Socialist Party. Now his history, he formed that in 1952, and allegedly he'd lived in Nazi Germany since 1937, and was a former SS member who fought and was wounded in the Battle of Berlin, and he was also a professor at the University of Munich. He returned to Iran in 1950, and would later serve as a professor of Persian studies at Alexandria University, and he was a known admirer of Hitler, and imitated many of the ways of the Nazi party, as well as attempting to approximate Hitler's physical appearance, including his mustache, so here are some pictures of him. He has the armband, he you know, has the Hitler mustache, this guy is like a big simp for Hitler, and it's not surprising he was a professor of Persian studies, because we've linked in how the Persian revisionist history is really linked to this fascism. But the Wikipedia article is saying that a lot of this needs confirmation. Someone was also saying that maybe his war record has been fabricated as well, or maybe he lied about it when he went back to Iran. I just don't know at this point. So treat it with a bit of skepticism. So the National Socialist Party in Iran had about 600 strong membership. And it says in the article that Sumka briefly attracted the support of young nationalists in Iran. They were firmly opposed to the rule of Mohammad Mosaddegh during their brief period of influence, and the party worked alongside Fazlullah Zahadi in his opposition to Mosaddegh. In 1953, they were part of a large group of Zahadi supporters who marched towards the palace of, of the Shah, demanding the ousting of Mosaddegh. The party would become associated with street violence against the supporters of Mosaddegh and the Tula party, which is the Communist Party. The party had an assault group with an estimated size of 100 members that openly attacked members of the Communist Party of Iran and the Soviet Cultural Center and the Hungarian Trade Office in Iran. Colonel Fatah, officer of the Imperial Iranian Air Force, was responsible for training the unit. He was also an official patron of the group. And after the 1953 coup, the party received a monthly stipend of 2,500 Iranian rial from the police and other security forces. In 1958, Monshizda received $7,000 from the Savak to go to the United States. The party was also possibly financed by foreign embassies in Iran, and Monshizda actually sought to get funding from the British embassy in Iran. So it's pretty small and it's pretty short-lived, but it's interesting anyway. Here you have people and you have a guy who supposedly fought for the SS during the Battle of Berlin, supposedly injured in the war, comes back to Iran, is a massive simp for Hitler, dresses like Hitler, tries to start a Nazi party just like Hitler, wearing the armbands, doing the salute, looking like Hitler. And in the context of Iran, maybe it's surprising there wasn't more support for this guy. But maybe sometimes when you have nationalism that is so far right leaning that you kind of take oxygen away from this stuff, it's like a lot of people say the reason Britain didn't have a proper communist revolution like many other European countries is because the Labour Party, as a you know socialist party, kind of took the oxygen away from a more militant communist party. So you were dividing up the people who would potentially join a communist party if the Labour Party didn't exist. Maybe that is what happened in Iran after the war. Now, to finish off the video, we're going to talk about a weird news story from 2010, where an Iranian website popped up that was supporting the Nazis. Now, of course, over the last two decades, modern Iran has had quite a long history of denying the Holocaust, both in public and both of its political leaders. Even Rouhani, who's seen as a moderate, and he accepted that this event happened, but he would still sort of cast doubt on if the numbers were true. And obviously, because the old regime of the Shah were very friendly with Israel, but the Islamic theocracy is totally opposed to Israel. They're basically number one enemies. Iran's geopolitical goals are normally to fund Shia militias in countries like Afghanistan or countries like Syria. Occasionally, sometimes they also fund Sunni militias. So in the past, they have funded Hamas as well, who are obviously a Sunni militant group in Gaza. So it's a very interesting history Iran has here because 
before the Islamic Revolution, a lot of people had this belief in this Aryan style nationalism. And of course they had that before the Second World War. And then after the revolution, they have a new type of nationalism which takes on a more like anti-Semitic flavor that is away from Hitler a bit more. And it's driven by being anti-Israel. But I'm gonna read the Nazi controversy that came out like 10 years ago. So recent Nazi inclinations in the virtual domain of Iran. On November 18th, 2010, the Iranian news website Tabnak exposed a Persian pro-Nazi internet forum operating under the virtual domain assigned to the Islamic Republic, which is IR, the forum's content, which advocated Adolf Hitler's fascist ideology, generated acute interest in local and international media. The media was especially concerned with the involvement of the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, which is responsible for registration and approval of websites that operate under Iran's domain. Three days later, on November 21st, the news site Ross associated Ali Mohammed Rahman, the Deputy Minister of Culture and Islamic Guidance in charge of the media, since November 2009, with the operational permit granted to the pro-Nazi forum. According to Mohammed Reza Yazdan Panah, the reporter for Faroz, Rahman also heads the World Holocaust Foundation in Iran, and he is the leading official advising Ahmadinejad on issues related to the negation of the Holocaust. And their old president was a real firebrand for always denying this stuff. So this stuff does seem like it does have some ties to the old Iranian administration. So the article goes on to say, Whereas in the past, similar websites were filtered and removed from Iran's global network, during the past year and a half, it seems the Islamic Republic has not acted with the same level of vigilance against racist manifestations of Iranian ultranationalism in its virtual domain. Many Iranian pro-Nazi virtual communities are advocating an ideology of racial supremacy that's against Arab Muslims and Muslims of other non-Aryan ethnic groups, a position that stands in diametric opposition to the pan-Islamic legacy of Ayatollah Khomeini and the Islamic Revolution. Moreover, some of these groups openly support the establishment of a secular state based on national socialism that will exclude Islamic laws. And then the article goes on to talk about Iran's growing internet and how there is more pro-fascist like web pages that Iranians are going on. Of course, they have more control over their internet in Iran and to have the government looking through these things and the government have to approve the IR stuff. But that is why these guys thought in the report that the government may have actually approved this directly. And even though they had oversight, they probably didn't care because of the stuff they had going on with Israel at the time. And basically the contemporary fascists and Nazis in Iran hate the government and a lot of them also do not like Islam as well. And that's just another interesting wrinkle to this story. So I guess that is it for the video. To conclude, and it's very interesting, that the Shah before World War II cultivated this nationalism and then allied with Hitler because he thought there's some sort of ethnic racial solidarity between Iran and Germany. And the nationalism he cultivated obviously relied on revisionist history of the ancient times, thinking there is a massive ethnic and historical through line from 2,500 years ago to Iran in the 1930s. Obviously, Iran's actions in World War II were influenced by stuff that was going on in Palestine at the time, but also just a lot of Iranians buying into this nationalism. And then you have the legacy of that war, is that you have people coming back to Iran to join the Nazi party, people who fought for the SS, and then you have, in contemporary Iran, this stuff not really existing, but maybe a bit. And because of the climate of you know, their relations with Israel, it seems like previous administrations would maybe tolerate this stuff a bit more. But because these fascists are anti-Gov and often anti-Islam, it's not something that you're going to be seeing anytime soon. So that is it for the video. Very interesting topic. I like doing these ones where we combine history with contemporary politics. If you want to follow me on social media, at The Cavernacle on Twitter and Instagram, Come support me on Patreon, stuff like this is demonetized and I appreciate everyone's support. Come join our communities on Discord and on my subreddit as well. And if you want to look at my second channel, that is in the description. And if you made it this far, thank you all for watching.